Good day, everyone. I'm Joshua Prince, and you're listening to FinTech Startup Stories, where I interview entrepreneurs about how they got the ideas and how they built their businesses in this difficult South African environment. From the previous episodes on FinTech Startup Stories, we've really identified that there's a big problem of access to financing for small businesses. In fact, in 2019, there was a 90 billion rand credit gap for small businesses to obtain debt to fund their short-term uh, operations. So joining me today is the co-founder of a business called Fundu, who actually built an automated and innovative uh, business to quickly and efficiently provide that access to financing for small businesses. And they plan to employ over a billion rand over the next five years. But without further ado, Idan Yon, welcome to FinChat. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So Idan, as I understand... Funder. Funder is basically a financial service to provide credit for small businesses. You provide within 24 hours financing of between 20,000 and 500,000 Rand for business to employ over three to 12 months. Yeah, so that's pretty much it. So what we do is we've, we've identified the pitfalls of small businesses to access funding in South Africa. Like you said, it's the, the funding gap was um, close to 90 billion as of 2019. We're assuming it to be much bigger now uh, because of obviously the, the the current economic landscape so w- the problem i mean it's a worldwide problem but what we've noticed in south africa is that small businesses just cannot get access to finance from formal funding institutions such as the banks and it kind of created a big opportunity for uh, fintech startups that, such as funder to come in and truffle the gap so like you say we provide relatively short-term working capital for businesses we don't need any assets to back the, the, the loan. We don't need any um, stringent financial performance to get approval for the loan. You know, we want to we want to provide finance at the quickest and easiest uh, possible way to small businesses. And how do you actually go about it? Do you are you like some sort of agent for a, for a bank, or do you raise large sum of capital and then you employ that um, you you employ that uh, that funding? Yeah, so there's a few there's a few different ways, obviously, in which you can approach it. You know, there's some guys that originate the loans through the banks. We chose to go the, the opposite way. We we wanted to actually lend it off our own balance sheet. So um, we actually raise raise the capital to further deploy it into small businesses. So we are the actual ones that are making the decisions. We take on the risk and um, hopefully bear the fruit. Yeah. So, and and how did you actually raise that financing? So, did you put your own money in, and then you you uh, provide credit from um, your own equity, or do you also raise some uh, cheaper financing through debt? So, how it worked is, I mean, my partner and I, we both quit our jobs in November 2017. Um, I come from um, like the food and beverage industry. I was involved in a few in a few restaurants in the space. Um, Okay. Essentially, a small business owner myself identified the, the funding gap. My partner is uh, my best friend. Uh, we went to school together. He's a CA, so he went um, down um, the the corporate route. He, he moved to the states. He did two years in in the states, um, and then he decided that he wanted to kind of come and start his own uh, business. So. Uh, we put pen to paper, and we thought, um, why not? Why not look at this industry? Um, we to raise a lot of. We try to raise funding at the beginning, which proved like very, very hard. Uh, you know, we were just two young guys with an idea, um, which is which is very, very hard to to raise money on an idea. You know, execution is everything. So yeah. that kind of forced us to put our life savings into the business, and we were faced with. Um, like quite a big dilemma of what to do with such limited resources uh we 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 decided to just launch you know kind of do like a like a minimum viable product approach and yeah. we just we just compiled like and just created a, like a, the simplest product and just went to market and just started learning and started stress testing our models um so we bootstrapped the business you know we didn't we didn't take a salary for quite long. I think it was it was 11, 11 months or so. We didn't take anything from the business. Every single cent that we made went back into growing the business and growing the book. And uh, during that time, we were just trying to raise capital as much as possible. You know, one of the biggest pitfalls of our industry that we that we chose to to enter is is the the capital intensiveness. 
So we knew straight away from day one that the bootstrapping um, approach was a short term was a short term um, yeah. kind of like fulfillment. So so we always kept in mind that we needed to raise more capital, and we always kept in mind like we have to speak to people and and basically raise money. And it led to a lot of rejection and a lot of um, like realization that it's really hard to raise capital, especially when you don't have the track record and you don't have too much experience. You know, we don't we don't come from credit ourselves. We don't have a credit background, so that yeah. proved hard. And you know, we were sitting with like over like fifty to sixty rejections. Um, every single every single pitch that we made and every single rejection that we'd gotten was was we we saw it rather as a learning curve rather than a disappointment so we kept on learning and seeing what investors look for and what what we need to improve and what we need to kind of prove to them that uh why to invest in us and finally in 2019 in may 2019 we managed to access um a, a high net worth individual and we managed to secure some angel investment, um, which helped us grow our operation and basically get us to where we are today. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, so let's get, let's, let's get actually to those um, 50 to 60 rejections that you speak about, because I think that's an important, as you say, you guys learned a lot from that process. And I think it's a big, um, it's a big part of being an entrepreneur and especially for, for young people and for the youth. I think you get it rejected a lot just because you don't have a track record or, or, or a lot of experience in a certain industry. So do you have some good stories or some good, some good failures, if I can call it that, um, that you can share with, uh, with the audience of what, what you actually learned through that process and um, how you could have done it quicker and maybe reduced your your rejections if if i can call it that you know what like i think there's there's a common problem which my partner jared and i faced is that we were obviously biased you know everyone's biased on the on the business idea everyone thinks that their business idea is going to change the world um but you have to remain cognizant of the fact that the investor is looking at it in luck like, as, as as a binary and like black but, and he just needs to fulfill the certain like questions and get certain amount of comfort in the business to put his or her hard-earned capital into the business. So yeah. I guess one of the biggest biggest problems that we had when raising capital is that we try to raise a lot of money pre-revenue. We didn't want to start the business before we had substantial capital behind us, which we believed was... Uh, it kind of wasted our time you know we should have just gone to market a little bit earlier um mm. we kept on trying to raise capital on a pre-revenue idea and a lot of guys that we like spoke to you know we went with this pitch deck and all these projections and very good looking presentations and we were pitching to them and presenting and but it was just an idea you know uh, ideas are cheap execution is everything i think what investors need to see and one to see is execution the ability to execute because yeah. you know we, we we had like a lot of investors that we went up in front and said this is what we want to do this is our big idea um and then they were like they were just showing us like how basically how many ideas there are in the market you know they would just like open up their laptop type in like on google like five startup ideas and like show us be like look i also have five ideas kind of thing you know it just shows yeah ideas are easy people just want to see execution and resourcefulness you know um i think once we once we got to market and once we actually started the business with our own capital and bootstrapped the business and pumped every single cent that we made back into the business it showed it showed various things to investors it showed it shows the the, the 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 operational capability of the jockeys it showed yeah. the, the skin in the game it showed that we had we, we put everything into this business it showed that we we care about the business we're not draining the business but rather carry on putting money into the business to grow the business and it showed how durable we are you know um how we can make something out of nothing so um, if they had to give us an extra something, we can make much more. We can make a lot more with it than 
um, than we had, you know? Yeah. So how many rejections did you actually have before you started employing your own capital? And then how many uh, after? Probably, probably half, half, probably half, half, half. You, halfway through you realize that you know we just have to start like let's just start let's just you know we, we always we always were going to deploy our own capital into the business but we knew that it wouldn't get us as far as we want to have want mm. to be so um we always said you know we are going to put this capital and why don't you kind of match us uh, just to start that was like a oh. revenue pitch okay and then you both you and jared um Put like seven hundred and fifty rand, seven hundred and fifty thousand rand each into the business. Correct. Yeah. So that was our initial um, capital contribution. You know, at the beginning, it went as a, as a as a shareholders' loan, which we were quite naive. Um, <laughs> yeah. But then we obviously had to shore up the balance sheet and, and convert and put it as equity. But you know what? It's okay. You know, at the end of the day, if you show uh, your money where your mouth is, that's the most important thing. You know, people like to see that. You know what you you always you always got to put yourself in the investor's shoes right i mean they've worked extremely hard to get that capital you know it's not it's it's hard earned money yes. um and and no one wants to part with the hard earned cash on on just some sort of a blurb on a, of an or an idea you know like yeah they need to have some representation that they don't take they're not taking on too much risk and they'll they'll be able to get return on the investment exactly i think the biggest problem with well i can't speak for everyone but with us it was you know you you get romanticized you read about all these silicon valley startups and you see how they raise these ridiculous valuations of a pre pre-revenue idea and i think that that would also happen here in south africa but unfortunately it doesn't the, the risk the the investment landscape in south africa the venture capital landscape in south africa is it's very risk averse, you know. Um, but let's talk a bit about that because don't you think don't you think that's holding us back a bit? Because um, yes, some of the angel investors who rejected you. I know it's it's a it's a difficult space to be in because um, in America it works like just because there is a, in, a, a flow of capital you in in a certain into a certain industry you'll be able to make a return. So some of uh, VCs will be able to invest now into health tech companies and maybe make a. 5x multiple in two years just because there is interest in health tech now not because the business is specific, uh, specifically interesting but don't you think that in south africa we can just because it's so difficult to raise capital and so difficult to um to build a business don't you think if you have an idea and vcs back you fully with a big valuation that you have a, a, a bigger a lot bigger chance to actually succeed and build a big business to maybe um that produce large cash flows in five years or 10 years time just because of that initial large backing. Yeah, I, could, I definitely think that. I definitely think that. I think it's definitely holding out a lot of opportunities, you know, and it's kind of uh, a lot of startups don't, don't, don't surpass that kind of year or two, two year mark because of a lack of funding. Yeah. Um, but you know what, like, you just have to you just have to live with what the with what is presently out there you know you can't you can't expect that things will change you just got to kind of like motor on and just make do with what's out there you know yeah. like the unfortunate situation is that it is hard to raise capital you know maybe it will change in the next couple of years you know maybe the risk capital will change i mean i think this coronavirus has definitely gone in the other direction i think people are, are more risk averse at the moment than than they they're, than they're ready to deploy more capital um but you know what maybe things will change in the coming in the coming months or years um i hope it does because because you, you certainly, we've seen it, that you certainly need capital to grow. Yeah. This, you know, I mean, our industry is, is very capital intensive, so it's not, it's not a fair as, um, comparison to make. But, but any, I mean, you know, any startup that we know or speak to, I mean, you need, you need capital behind you. And the, the more risk averse uh, VCs are and angel investors, the harder it is for people to start their own business. Yeah. Um, so... So I'm hoping things will change, but you know what, like, this is the current situation. You can either work with it or, or kind of give up kind of thing, you know? So I think the best thing is to just 
work with it and just kind of get through that 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 patch and, and prove a proof of concept basically so you can go out and raise capital yeah because the thing is I, I think what's also different in south africa compared to america is because it is actually in america it's almost more difficult to be successful as a startup because if you have an idea most certainly there's like five other people in america that also get large valuation also get a lot of money into their business quickly so then the competition is is very high and it's it's difficult to then break it to be a market leader but that's what i think there's actually opportunity in south africa where just because you don't get access to financing quicker if someone has access to financing quicker say now your team got funding a lot quicker than the other startups the 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 chances of you succeeding compared to the others are a lot higher so yeah it's it's interesting to think about it um because it can be actually a critical success factor or, or, or rather um, a key value driver in a business for if the founders are just good at raising capital because ultimately that's a large portion of the success. I completely agree. I completely agree. Look, I would definitely say that it has like a 50-50 like a split, right? Like raising capital is, is a skill of its own, but then also you need to have a good business and I guess good operations of business and a good idea to raise the capital, you know, uh, the ability to raise capital is just one aspect of it, but you actually need to prove that you're worthy of that capital, you know, yeah, and, and that's why, that's why to, to touch on my point earlier, it's like, you just need to start. Like we just needed to, to just start and, and have a little bit of a track record to, to show guys, to say, look, we've achieved x with this much capital that we put in now if you give us an extra amount we can definitely reach wow yeah. so now our projections are based off real love um numbers yes. you know it's not just it's, just it's not just numbers on paper it's more it's more like um it's it's a realistic kind of um pathway yes you know definitely um so let's get actually back to the idea of your business. You identif you said earlier that you were um you were you worked in in the food industry and small business owner or was it a restaurant I think you said what how did you actually get the idea and said okay I can actually put all my life savings into this business. Um yeah talk us a bit about through that idea and how you got Jared on board and so on. So what happened was um, I just went and, and studied a, like just a plain BCom. Um, and afterwards, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. Like I think like most, most, uh, most students and my brother owns, um, he owns a business that has a few different like franchises, uh, mainly in the food and beverage industry and its umbrella. So he kind of offered me to come in, you know, it's, it's quite entrepreneurial in this in this uh, um, environment. Mm. Said, so why don't you come here and kind of like find your feet? I landed up spending it was about around three years uh, working under his his, um, his company and his umbrella, assisting all the small businesses within the umbrella. And then we kind of launched our own concept. It was called uh, it's called Nona's Italian Food Bar, um, and we landed up. Uh, opening a store in in Santon City, and then one in in Mainland Shopping Center, okay. and we opened one in Botswana, and one in Dubai, and then one in Cape Town, and this land up like now it's it's a well run franchise. Um, so essentially, like I said, I was a small owner myself. Um, what was happening? We had like a very solid brand. We had you know amazing reviews online. We had queues running out the door for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but at the end of the month, we were running into cash flow problems ourselves, oh, okay. um, uh, which led us, which led us to go to the banks and kind of ask for cash flow assistance. And we saw that was taken ridiculously long, um, and therefore um, we saw the the inability to access finance as a small business in South Africa. I think that was kind of like a microcosm of what was happening out there in the economy. Yeah. Um, went on holiday. My partner, Jared, uh, like I said, he spent two years in the States. So he was at GT. So he was in the States. I, I went there on a, uh, for a holiday. 
um, naturally we met up for for some beers and we we spoke and he was telling me how he wants to come back to South Africa to start kind of um, doing something on his own and I told him I was like oh, I also want to do something like different on my own and we kind of he, he we used to like have these like Skype sessions where he used to go um, in the states to like a Starbucks and we just used to like kind of identify um, problem uh, an industry that we wanted to go to go into identify a problem and obviously naturally you just discuss the pain points that each one of us has had along you know our, our journey so far um, to identify a problem that we can identify with and business I, I get funding was was one of the one of the main ones that we've both kind of reached upon yeah and we started unpacking it further you know we started to see like what is the market size uh, who are their competitors what are people doing in south africa what's happening in the states in this space i mean who can we draw inspiration from yeah like you touched on earlier i mean the to be in in south africa has its advantages and disadvantages one of the advantages is that you can look at the overseas market to draw inspiration from and perhaps people aren't doing things like they are overseas and there's good opportunity to 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 do to do this to do it over here you know um and it literally went from a scarf conversation into a business plan um then jared came back to south africa and that's he quit his job he came back to south africa as he came back i kind of resigned and quit my job and we would just meet and kind of just unpack everything you know do a lot of market research kind of apply to our competitors apply to the bank see like what the pain points are what's the turnaround time what did they ask for yeah um you know just the whole process kind of map it out map where we would position our product to be and you know it, it had it had a lot of ups and downs but i think what it forced us to do is to actually be fully be committed to the idea you know i still think that if we had to kind of start it as a side hustle we wouldn't be where we are today you know we had to kind of both of us had to um sacrifice you know lifestyle salaries yeah. we had to sacrifice um certainty and um you know the comfortness of having a job and a salary to kind of explore this further no one gave us no one gave us the the kind of the green tick to say this is def you guys are definitely going to be able to start this thing it was just kind of leap of faith you know and we all we both knew that you know what worst comes to worst it doesn't succeed we can always make a plan yeah. you know it was it never crossed our mind if this doesn't succeed we're going to be on the street you know we we always had this thought at the back of our head that you know what we're going to try and if it doesn't work it doesn't work we're just going to go and like get a job somewhere it's not the end of the yeah. world and if it does work then we then we've then we executed on our dream and we can actually build something meaningful that we both know that we're solving a real problem and do things our way yeah that's fantastic and how much have you actually um how much debt have you actually applied by by now so we you know we're growing on like uh like a 20 percent month on month prior but you know um pre-covid definitely now we've you know, COVID was a big, was a big, big, um, was a big hurdle for us. You know, it's kind of a big black relief? swan for us. Or, um, or uh, payment holidays to your so, so exactly, exactly that. So, so what happened? You know, as as the hard lockdown came, you know, we had a we had a board meeting, um, and kind of we reached a consensus with our board that we're going to be focusing internally instead of externally. So okay. we're kind of going to put a hold on on providing more loans out in the market and kind of focus on our internal book. Straight away, we, we, we went out, uh, we approached all of our clients. We kind of understood, we segmented the book per industry and we kind of understood which industries are, are mostly affected by this lockdown. Um, the ones that were mostly affected, which was majority of our book on like level five lockdown, it's actually 90% of our book yeah, had to shucks. be on pay holiday. That's like, that's like a nine, percent um slash on our revenue because everything it wasn't even like we were collecting anything it was just a complete stop hard yeah. pause on 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 90 percent of our clients you know 10 percent were essential services 
Um, and those clients were actually booming during that phase, which they actually landed up settling, settling us early. You know, they actually landed up doing so well during this time. You know, it was mostly in the in the healthcare industry. Oh, fantastic. Um, yeah. And they were, they were booming. So um, they managed to... Um, get 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 out of their of the obligation and then we were left with um the clients that weren't operational and you know we had to take salary cuts we had to kind of cut all of our operational expenses you know which showed showed us the like the resiliency of our business you know how we can turn on and off yeah operational costs because which actually proved to be like amazing for us to see you know it's just nimbleness yeah um and and, and now you know as things have been getting better um econ- economical wise uh we've been we've been able to unlock more and more of our book you know currently it's like 13 percent of our clients on on a payment holiday so we've recovered oh, way quicker than we expected and i guess and i guess it just shows the resiliency of small businesses you know everyone thought we all thought that a lot of businesses are going to close um a lot of businesses are gonna gonna suffer tremendous tremendously from this lockdown but it just shows that people make a plan you know we've seen a lot of, a lot of our businesses kind of pivot and and just survive this it's been it's been great to see yeah it must actually be fantastic the stories that you see as well because you obviously see the story of a lot of small businesses and you see the resilience and all these um small business owners and see how they make a plan and um that that pure South African grit, you can see it coming through, and I must, I must say that must be quite inspirational. It's been unbelievable, you know. It's been uh, like I said, on on a board level, we we thought we really thought it was going to have a tremendous impact on our business, and it's just unbelievable to see how quickly like businesses recover from this. You know, where we at now? We expected, according to like our projections, we thought we would be where we are now only in November. Oh, fantastic. Um, and it just shows, yeah, I mean, we've seen some amazing stories, you know, we obviously on the ground essentially like with small businesses and we see like some guys, you know, one guy had a clothing manufacturing business and he's kind of pivoted into face masks and managing to create like, like good revenue. Uh, other guys went into, into sanitizers. A lot of guys went into PPE. It's just, it's just, it's amazing to see how people just adapt, you know, that no one's sitting and expecting things to happen. People are, are out there and, you know, on the ground, making things happen, taking matters into their own hands. This is, it's, it's actually such good news to hear. I must have, I'm sitting with a smile on my face. <laughs> it's so, it's so good to hear that people get sm- slapped down and then they just get up and they say, this is not going to happen on its own. And, and they make, they make decisions and get on with it. It's really, really inspiring to hear this. A hundred percent, and I felt, and I, we felt like um, we had this responsibility to kind of work with them and not be this lingering added pressure um, yeah. in their lives during like these hard times, you know. So we took the decision that, however long it may take them to get back on their feet, you know, we're gonna we're gonna work with them rather than just sit and be added pressure at the end of the month, you know. Did you get new clients during this time for businesses that actually? I uh, saw the opportunity to go into like face masks and sanitizers and PPE and so on. Yeah, so so we have we have we have onboarded a few more clients. Like I said, it, it hasn't been like our main focus. Yeah. We we've definitely been more focused internally on our internal clients, but at the same time, it doesn't mean we we've stopped we've stopped dispersing funds. So we've we've def- we've done we've done a few deals. We're definitely not at the level that we were pre-COVID, yeah. but you know what? For us, it's okay. It's it's just something. It's just a decision we took as a board, and um, we just want to rather see that our current clients are in a good, healthy financial position before we like go and onboard new clients. You know, now as things look better and better, you know, our strategy is changing, and we're definitely starting to focus outwards rather than inwards. Um, but we, yeah, we're expecting. I'm really, I'm really positive. 
you know, this is, it's, it's actually fantastic. Um, now, at the moment, your business is primarily focused on established businesses and providing that short-term financing for them. Do you ever see yourself actually expanding into filling that gap that you guys struggled with, that problem of not being able to effectively raise the angel money? Would you ever see yourself moving into that VC space and actually take up that, um, that opportunity? Sure. So definitely not as our, as our core product, definitely not through this business. Um, you know, obviously we raise, we raise capital on a strict mandate yeah. to use it to provide our product offering, you know? Um, so, so definitely not in the short term, you know, it's not the space that we're in. It's not our business. It's not our, uh, projected returns mm. that we, we can't make of, of this kind of investment. So, I definitely wouldn't think through this entity, maybe something in the future, but definitely no plans as of yet, you know? Yeah, because I would think you have like all the experience you see, you obviously work with a lot of SMEs, you see some good success, like what the critical success factors are, what the risk factors are. And like now the grit that you see, because this, like when they put a smile on my face, I immediately thought, but why then can't we get more financing if our um, small business owners are so resourceful and so clever to work through it? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. And it's definitely a pain point. And I mean, you see even like the government's entering this like space, like heavily because, you know, this is like kind of the backbone of the economy and it, and it needs fuel, especially during these times, you know, like a lot of businesses have been closed. A lot of businesses have been stretching their creditors at the moment because of their lack of operations yeah. and turnovers. So the whole economy is, is stretched thin. So there has to be some sort of capital injection which i think you know the, the government has certainly been doing um can they do it better i think every, everyone can they can there always be improvements everywhere in the world not just in south africa but at least at least there's people out there trying to make a difference you know and i think if everyone just gets together and pull their weights we'll be able to we'll definitely be able to come out of it yeah no definitely oh, that's that's so super interesting and, and actually exciting for me um so does the, is the government actually raising capital to employ into small businesses or, or startup funding, or do they already have that? Um, or how does that work? Do you know? Yeah, so so they they um, they raise capital to deploy through the banks. So I know a lot of the COVID relief um, funding that's been happening through the banks. It's 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 government guaranteed, and the government's getting involved in that level. You know, I know in the States, they actually utilize like fintech lenders to disperse their loans, uh, um, which would have been, which would have been amazing if we can get that in South Africa, yeah. just because of, uh, you know, it's just because like we, we look at credit differently. We, we definitely, I, I don't know, we do things different, you know, we, we definitely do things different and it would have been easier to disperse the loans through entities such as, such as funder. But currently, it's happening through the banks at bank level. You know, there's been there's been success stories and there's been painful stories. That's just as 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 everything does. You know, we had some clients that had a pleasant experience and quick turnaround time and and everything through the bank, and we had some clients that basically are still waiting for an answer for March. So, yeah, sure. I mean, um, it's it has some positives and negatives, but I think the intention is there. You know, can they do it? better definitely but i think i think we'll get there you know yeah because i would think like funder would be a a, a a fantastic avenue for the government to take because you have a lot less regulation in that way and you can quick more exactly. quickly give out the loans um and, and your systems are designed to do it within 24 hours so it would make more sense to actually use the avenues of the the um the startups and the new fintechs to disperse it but um, hopefully that goes into the future. Maybe we learn from this and it happens in the future. Exactly. Exactly. Maybe we can draw inspiration from overseas because I think it's been, it's been working really well overseas. Uh, dispersing, I don't know about collection, but disbursement's definitely been more efficient overseas. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Okay. So end off, um, let's start up with like the, the, the questions that we ask all our entrepreneurs, um, all our guests. So obviously as an entrepreneur, you have, you, you had an idea and, and you started a business previously with a, um, with a food business and now you started Funder. 
do you have any other ideas of things that you just think about and you think, oh, that would actually be quite cool that we can discuss? Uh, you know, um, you always you always have ideas, but like nothing too material. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, it's it's so important not to lose focus. You know, even like even like my partner and I, you know, along even even along the funder journey, we've we've kind of looked at other things to do. Yeah. Um, even within a similar space, but you know, you soon realize that it just takes it. it takes so much energy and so much effort to to even think about something else that it's it's time wasted yeah. on your current idea you know it's so important to remain focused because ideas will come and go um it's it's important to to kind of focus on the fruitful ones and we've identified fund has been a fruitful idea yeah. so far you know i don't know what's going to happen in the future maybe we'll do other things together but for now, I think it's very important to remain like focused. So even though we always throw ideas around, it's it's something that we definitely don't execute or pay too much attention to because, you know, you have to remain focused. I mean, it, 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 it was a draining process to get to where we're at now, you know, and it's, and it's only, and that was like the startup phase, you know, I, yeah. think, the, I think the growth and sell phase is going to be as intense. So I think it's very important to, to just remain focused. Yeah, we've, you know? we've had that uh, response by a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, so next one, what was the top three challenges of starting a business in South Africa? Um, we've established like the raising the funding. Um, what, what are the three challenges that you really face in South Africa in starting a business? Um, that's a good question. So I think definitely one is the, the, uh, the access to funding. I mean that was that was a major one. Um, two, I would say for us, I don't even know if it's in South Africa or just a worldwide problem. I think for us, the 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 lack of income was was huge. You know, the the kind of not taking a salary for a oh. prolonged period of time. I think that that was that was a that was huge for us. You know, especially where both of us came from earning a salary um so for us to drop to drop that was was kind of like massive and it wasn't like it wasn't like we knew we had a prospect of being like okay so go a year and after a year you definitely guaranteed to get to get a salary it was kind of like we don't know when like this will ever happen or if and when it will happen let's just kind of carry on building until we reach a point where we can do it so i think that was huge and I think the uncertainty, the uncertainty was definitely the third biggest thing. Like, so the way we saw it is like, like that was our prime years of like having the ability to, you know, be young with no big overheads on our personal lives. Yeah. You know, we just we, we can afford we can afford to go out there and take risks. You know, as you get older, the, your it's harder and harder to take risks because you know of, of various factors so i think that uncertainty of is this actually going to be good or are we wasting like our prime years on like a silly idea kind of thing you know that was definitely always the main the main struggle like should like i always knew that i wanted to do like something like with jared and start a business we that we figured out like very early on that we're going to do something together now I think the biggest problem was, is this the idea? Is this what we're going to yeah. do? You know, because it wasn't the only, it wasn't the only business idea that we had. Um, we just picked this one and we said, are we actually wasting, is it going to be good? Or are we wasting like all this time on this idea where we could have used it on other ones, you know? So I guess the uncertainty was definitely the hardest, one of the hardest things for me. Did you um did you put like a, a, a expiry date um, by the time that you would have like realized now this is not going to work out um uh, let's go look for a job did you like tell it like did you discuss it beforehand We actually didn't you know <laughs> we didn't I don't know if it's good or bad but we didn't because we were just going with it you know it's Yeah I assume it's good because you were like no this is going to succeed we don't even need to discuss that <laughs> literally that kind of thinking Yeah um we, we just kind of went for it, you know, we didn't put a timeline on it. I mean, I think 
looking back, even if it had to stretch another year without like salaries, we probably would have stuck it out because as long as you as long as you set like internal targets, like manageable and achievable targets and you hit those, yeah. Like it doesn't everything else doesn't matter. As long as you see progress within like your your startup, I think that's the most important. You know, it doesn't even have to be monetary um targets. It's just reaching goals and objectives. As long as you set literally, I think that's the most important thing, you know, because that keeps you motivated and it keeps you going and it kind of keeps you positive, you know. Yeah, when when did when did you actually get your first um customers? When did you start making your first revenue? How did you get your first customers? In June 2018. So we quit our jobs. It was quite quick, oh, actually, because what we did, we, yeah, so what so what happened was, um, like I said, we, we soon realized after like trying to raise capital that we just need to start. We just need to launch and we just need to like kind of prove our concept. So um, at June 2018, we just kind of- Do you go to small businesses? Ourselves, you know, we launched- we we literally put ourselves on the market and started looking at businesses. Um, you know, we, we were quite we were quite scared at the beginning, um, as one is. Yeah. So we 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 kind of approached like businesses that we knew. You know, small business that we knew from our network and just people that we know. Um, and it just happened to be that most of them needed needed financial assistance, which they couldn't get access to, which kind of proved our point. Oh. So the market and, take up was you know, quite good. We, yeah. And we just started lending in a very controlled environment to people that we knew. Yeah. Um, and that's how, that's how we actually started, started the operation. And, I, and that's actually, that's actually quite nice because one of the biggest benefits of a, um, of a business to business solution is that you can actually just start off with your, um, with your own network and you don't need a large volume of clients to actually get the business going because like each client, the, the size of the revenue you get from each client is a bit bigger than having like a business to customer solution. I completely agree. I completely agree. I have, you have to just start, Yeah. Uh, whether it's from your network, from your family, from your friends, like you just have to start, uh, like controlled environments are very good at the beginning just to like kind of run like a sort of a love simulation yeah. you can call it you know <laughs> just to see if your product were ask them what what uh, did you did you like uh, the user experience did you like the journey did you like the customer service it's also good for feedback you know mm. so once you like really open the taps to the market actually get some unbiased positive feedback yeah and they'll actually do it out customers. of the goodness of their heart <laughs> exactly which is very important you know we learned a lot um from from those early early kind of uh, disbursements we learned what the customers actually saw from our journey you know because like i said at the beginning you, you become very biased you think your product is the best and you think the way you envision it is the yeah best. but you know what a lot of times like like you're not you're wrong and a lot of times you just need to hear it from the people to to understand what the, what the market wants rather than what you want. you want yeah definitely um so actually if you could start the business again is there anything that you would do differently sure that's a good question um funny enough not i think i think our journey is as as stressful and as disappointing at, at it's been at times i think was i think all those rejections and all the everything just led us to bootstrap the business and i think it's it was the best thing in the world for us um first of all as entrepreneurs and second of all for the business um i think i think it taught us to be so resourceful and so lean mm. and just taught us to make something out of nothing. And I think that's the most important lesson um, that we could ever learn from. And I think that if we did manage to get access into capital pre-revenue, things would have been different. You know, we kind of would have been a little bit spoiled and yeah. uh, would have would have had a lot of money at our disposal to do things the way we envisioned it. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying for us, the fact that we had to pour our life savings into it and and, we, we counted for every cent and penny, you know, and that kind of 
forced us to really make something out of nothing. And I think it's so important. It's so important because when we do now, when we do have access to capital, we can utilize it in a way more efficient yes. manner than perhaps we could have been. Yes, definitely. And um, I actually want to ask you, so how did you actually get access to 50 to 60 angel investors? Because I don't think I ever know two. <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, we just uh, a lot searching on the internet, you know, a lot. Um, speaking to friends and family, asking them, you know what, like, at the beginning, we, we had this idea or notion that, you know what, let's not like say our business idea to like anyone because people might steal it and that's all rabbit. Yeah. You know, we, we soon, we soon realized the more people you speak to, the more, the better it is because then this one is this one and this one can help you with this. And yeah. just landed up, it just, just once we started like speaking to people about what we want to do, everyone kind of pointed us in a direction of, of like speak to this person, speak to this oh. one, uh, which, you know, you, you land up going for a meeting with this one. And then he says, listen, doesn't really like fit within my investment criteria, but I can refer you to this person. And then it set up an intro mail and then we go meet you with him. Oh. So it's kind of a knock on effect. You know, once you put yourself out there, um, you, you, you will find people, you know, yeah. and that's, that's the most important thing. You just need to get out there. Yeah. Fantastic. And now lastly, what tips do you actually have for the youth of South Africa and for the students who want to start businesses? Um, I think, I think very important, choose, choose, um, an industry that is, is that kind of, you, you understand and relates to you. Um, mm. choose, choose a rev, choose a revenue model that you think makes sense. Um, I, I strongly advise to, like, to advise to pick like a co-founder. I think, the, the journey is like, it's super, super hard doing it together with someone, never mind alone. I think doing it alone is so hard. And especially pick a co founder that, like, you know, you trust and has a different skill set than you, yeah. you know? Like, I mean, my partner and I are so different um, in terms of skill sets that we bring into the business that, like, I, 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 I would never be able to get where I am if I didn't have a person like him on board, you know, I think it's so important to diversify your skill set, and, and, and obviously I'm assuming vice versa. And mm. I think, I think if you have an idea, you just need to start, you know, I think that's probably the biggest thing that we like, that we learned like, mm. like at the, at the point, at the time, it was like the worst thing because it was like a failure. You know, we were like, we want to raise capital. We want to raise capital. Oh, we can't. Oh, second best choice. Okay, let's just start. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think it's the best thing. Like, just step out of your comfort zone. Just start, you know? Like, worst comes to worst. Like, it doesn't work out. You learned a fortune from it. Yes. And, and you can either, you know, you can always get a job if, you, if you're well-educated. And, you know, if, you, if you're a smart person, like, you can always get a job. The job's not a problem. Mm. Um, starting a business is the hard part. So, so just start. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You know, um, most chances are that if you do it smartly, you won't you won't lose your money if you if you're in control of 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 um of what you spend it on. Yeah. If you're in control of the outcome, then we, we never we never we were never scared that we were going to lose our money. We were scared that we were wasting our time on the wrong idea, uh, yeah. and it landed up being the right idea. But at least we started, you know. And if we didn't start, and if we just kept kept on saying to ourselves like we can't start until we raise capital we probably would be sitting on the same position um, um where we were back then today just waiting for this magic wand yeah. to come and and kind of fix all our problems but you know what we put we put money where our mouth is even if you like even if you don't have like access to capital like like we did at the beginning from working jobs if you're just a student then you know like approach friends, family, take a look, just whatever it takes, just try, try to get your product to market at the most cost effective way, make it the cheapest way so you can actually learn and show something tangible to investors. Mm. That's what they want to see. They want to see, look what, look what I've done so far. It just shows resiliency and, and a good jockey. You know, everyone wants a good jockey. That's what they look for first. I mean, all the investors back jockeys. Yeah. Business idea comes second. 
just a jockey, it's a person. Can you make something happen out of nothing? And if you prove it, even on a small scale, you know, even if you if you're trying to I don't know, sell a product, like that's that's your business idea, selling a product. Like literally go there and sell the product, even if it's out of the boot of your car. Yeah. Show investors that the market likes it, that people like it. You got some positive feedback. Show them what you managed to do and show them how their capital can fuel or further fuel your business. Fantastic. Thank you so much. You know, it was it was a really fantastic conversation. Laka, thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Fantastic. That was Idan Yon, CEO and co-founder of Funder. That is Funder. Uh, two R's at the end and no E if you N-D-R-R. Um, thank you guys so much for listening. Until next time, goodbye.